Are you ready to talk about movie number four, King Kong, from our 100 Essential Films pop chart movie poster? Because I know I am. Okay, so starting off, let's talk about the year that this came out. Okay, so this was the 1933 version, uh, the original version of King Kong, with a budget of, at the time, $672,254.75 converted to today's money was somewhere over $3 million, which is still a crazy amount. Uh, the box office draw was $5.3 million at the time. Converted to money now is over $100 million for the film. So that's a, that's a pretty big, um, that's a pretty big draw for it. I have to imagine, though I didn't find anything that specifically said it, that the reason the budget for it was so large was because of the stop-motion animation. A lot of the King Kong scenes are stop-motion animation back in 1933. Now, if you compare it to what we have today, yeah, it's going to fall short. But imagine going to the movies for the first time and seeing something like that done. Oh my god, I would love to have seen what everybody's reaction was staring up at the, at the movie screen, watching a ginormous gorilla monster attacking New York City. So even though there are a lot of characters in this movie, I'm really only gonna focus on primarily four of them. Of course, the star of the show, the eighth wonder of the world, King Kong and the love interest of our hero, King Kong, and the love interest of our hero, King Kong, played by Faye Ray, a street thief turned movie actress um, <laughs> in the blink of an eye, Anne. Uh, the male lead of the movie who then becomes the love interest of Anne is a gentleman named Jack, and the director of the film, not King Kong, but the film in which is inside of King Kong, getting a little meta here, is Carl Denham. Now there are more people in this film, but not a lot of them are in it for long, so we're just gonna focus on those four primarily for the breakdown of the plot crunch of this movie. So the movie starts where we find out the New York filmmaker, known for filming wild animals, who is Carl Denham, plans on making a trip to film his next big movie, but he's keeping a lot of the details very hush-hush. He rents a ship, fills it up with the crew of not only the ship, but the crew members of his movie. The camera guys, the other actors, while still trying to find his uh, lead actress for the film, he stumbles upon a uh, down-on-her-luck Anne trying to, or thinking about, stealing an apple. She doesn't actually steal it because she's a good person. Like me. Offers her the job and brings her to the ship to sail off on an adventure. Once they have already set sail and it's too late for anybody to change their mind or go back, Denim decides to release a little bit of more information about the movie he plans on making. They are looking for a place called Skull Island to search for a monster he had heard about from another sailor who didn't quite make it. They find Skull Island and show up just in time to ruin the sacrifice that goes by the name of the Bride of Kong. The villagers are very upset at this sacrifice being ruined because it's kind of important to their way of life. The villagers see Anne, who they describe as the Golden Woman, being the, the natives of the island, they're all brunette. This is the first time they've seen a blonde female. And they offer Denim and Jack a trade of six brunettes for one blonde. Now, I've tried searching the internet to find out what the conversion rate is for six blondes in 1933 compared to what they're worth now. Um, and, and then, of course, what the conversion rate is for a blonde from 1933 to 2020. I was not able to find any answers, but I'm pretty sure I raised a bunch of red flags on some websites. So uh, let's hope that doesn't lead to anything later on down the line. Being true gentlemen, 
the crew members reject the deal, you know, as you're supposed to do. Leaving them no other option, the villagers kidnap Anne that night to sacrifice her to the giant gorilla-like monster named Steve. But for some reason, everybody calls Kong in this movie. I think there was a problem in translation. The crew goes to save Anne after she is kidnapped by, for continuity reasons, I'll say Kong throughout the rest of this film, but remember it's Steve. To the crew member's surprise, they run into a Stegosaurus. <laughs> because on Skull Island, dinosaurs still exist. Once they get past the Stegosaurus, they run into a people-eating Brontosaurus, which I'm pretty sure I pronounced incorrectly. But in the meantime, Kong is off on his own adventure with his new bride. Now, I know they call him Kong the Eighth Wonder of the World, but he should be Kong, king of beating the hell out of every other giant animal in the jungle for a blonde, because he runs into a T-Rex, which he demolishes in a pretty brutal way, um, I guess as giant gorillas and dinosaurs go, but really interesting to see in stop-motion animation. He also runs into a, and get ready, because I know I'm going to screw this up, an Alasomosaurus, which is a giant eel-like creature. Um, if I'm smart, I'll edit that part out and just say he ran into another dinosaur. <laughs> um, but then after that, he also runs into a Pteriodon, uh, which again, I'm pretty sure uh, you pronounce the P in that word, but I digress. Kong does everything he can to keep his bride safe. You know, like a gentleman. As Kong is fighting with the pterodon, pterodon? The big bird thing, Anne and Jack escape and run towards the shore. When Kong gets there, he is uh, bombarded with gas bombs and captured and put on the ship and transported back to New York City. Now, once they're back in New York City, Denim puts on a giant production at a theater to show off King Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. This is also the scene where we find out that Jack, just previously meeting Anne for the very first time in his life, has proposed to her and they are engaged to be married the following day. Now, I know my views on marriage probably differ greatly from a lot of you, but I'm pretty sure we can agree this isn't the way it should go down. The curtains draw back and we see King Kong shackled to a giant contraption keeping him in place. As photographers take pictures of Jack and Anne and Denim and King Kong, Denim explains how it would be impossible for Kong to break out of these chains just in time for Kong to break out of these chains. It's almost like it was written in the script that way. Everybody starts running for their lives, and Jack, of course, takes his bride-to-be up to the hotel room because all of this is getting him hot and bothered. Okay, so maybe I'm being a little too hard on Jack and his decision-making skills, but they do run to the higher-level floor where their hotel room is, and while they are listening to all the ruckus going on, King Kong is now climbing up the side of the building in search of his bride, Anne. As all of this is going on, Kong is climbing the side of the building looking for his bride, who also happens to be Anne. Really, King Kong from 1933 is just a story about a love triangle that gets way out of hand. Now, going back to Jack's terrible decision-making skills, when they see King Kong outside of the window and his hand busts through, Jack picks up a chair to hit King Kong's hand away. Instead of grabbing his wife-to-be and running into the hallway, Jack is batted to the floor, as he rightfully should be, trying to fight a giant gorilla with a chair. And Kong steals his wife and brings her out through the window, where a weird series of events happens, including Kong climbing to the top of the building, putting her down, 
picking her back up, climbing down to ground level, fighting a fighting a train, and then climbing to the top of the Empire State Building. Now, I really have to hand it to the New York City Police Department in figuring out that the way to handle a giant gorilla climbing a, a building in the middle of New York City is to shoot him down using planes. But that they were able to get the planes there really quickly. Now atop of the Empire State Building, Kong puts his beloved wife down as he now fights off and swats at four gun-toting airplanes. He does manage to get in one fatal swoop and take down a plane, but he does not do so well against the next three. They shoot him, he loses balance, and he falls from the top of the Empire State Building. And as a, a, a long distance shot, we see him hit a few of the levels on the way down before crashing onto the floor of New York City. This movie ends with a back and forth that makes me so angry, and I will explain it to you now. <laughs> uh, it is between Denim and one of the officers in front of a giant dead Kong, King Kong. You know, the gorilla that was minding his own business on an island far away from New York City, far away from planes, just doing what he's doing. And the officer says to Denim, as if Denim thought maybe Kong got away and was free or still rampant or whatever, uh, the officer says, and I, I want to quote this correctly, and the officer says, the planes got him. Like if it wasn't the planes, there was going to be something else up there that, that made him fall or whatever. Mm, okay. But then Denim replies with, no, it wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty that killed the beast. No, I'm pretty sure it was the planes. Maybe the bullets had a lot to do with it too. Beauty had very little to do with why King Kong is dead. More importantly, if you're going to blame anybody other than the planes, it's you, you greedy director, gorilla stealing I'm so mad that even in my notes for this, I just wrote the word rant. That's it. I just, I'm angered. I'm filled with, just leave giant gorillas alone. This is Harambe all over again. There's another senseless act of gorilla violence and there needs to be an end to it. <sighs> Calm down. Relax. Or I stand by the opinion that art should get an emotional reaction. Whether it be cheerful and happy, whether it be remorse or sad, or even anger at people that kill gorillas. Art in any form, whether it be song or paintings or celluloid, should it should get a response of emotion. And King Kong from 1933 absolutely did that for me. Which brings me to my next part, one of my favorite parts. We get to scratch off King Kong from our 100 Essential Movies poster. Let's, let's have at it. Eiffel, nope. So I'm pretty sure behind this Empire State Building, there is going to be a beautifully colored King Kong. If not, I will be very confused. But, oh, there we go. That is awesome. Oh yeah, that is a very pretty reveal there. All right. So there you have it. That is the reveal of 1933's King Kong off our 100 Essential Movies list. Next week's movie is It Happened One Night from 1934. We're just moving right along there. 
Uh, if I can find a link to this, maybe from Amazon or Netflix or something, I'll post it in the video below for King Kong, so you guys can join in next week as well. This has been the 100 Essential Movies Tuesday Review. Now, if you're following on Instagram or TikTok or anything like that, you will know that we also had come in the 100 horror films, the 100 horror movies. We are starting off with the 1920 The Cabinet of Dr. Calgary, uh, which I believe is on Amazon. These movies are going to be released on Thursday, so if you don't want to miss out on those, make sure that you are subscribed below and hit the notification buttons, uh, especially that little bell so that you don't miss out on any of these awesome films. And as always, I couldn't do this without the help from my Patreon followers that are about to pop up right now. Thank you guys so much. It means a lot to me that you have my back. Um, I have big things in store for 2021, and I want all of you to be a part of it. So thank you very, very much. Until then, I will catch you next Tuesday. Later days. Remember, surprise, they run into a Stegosaurus. <laughs> a Stegosaurus. Shit. <laughs>